hearing is a big deal for me because I was six weeks premature. So uh, they think that uh, the exposure to oxygen started a progressive nerve loss. So I lose about one decibel a year of hearing. And it was noticeable when I was in uh, elementary school. People thought I was not paying attention and they realized that it was because I wasn't hearing. But it wasn't until I was about 13 that we finally decided I needed hearing aids. My friends said that they noticed that when I had to change the battery, I would start talking so that they couldn't say anything while I was changing the battery so I wouldn't miss anything. So I've become very comfortable with these things and, and I encourage other people to be upfront about um, things that they might need help with. It was a consequence of my hearing impairment and my hearing aids that led to my meeting my wife in 1965 because she was almost totally deaf. And uh, the hearing aid dealer called me and said, you need to show up and meet this woman. So uh, I drove down to uh, Wilshire Boulevard where our hearing aid dealer was. And I got there around noon or so and our hearing aid dealer, Ted Deduziak, introduced us and then closed the shop and left us standing out on Wilshire Boulevard on Miracle Mile. And she's really cute and I'm trying to figure out how I keep this going. So I, I said, would you like lunch? So she agreed to have lunch and uh, she said, uh, would you like to see my favorite painting at the LA County Art Museum, which is down the street the other way? Yes, you know, anything to keep this going. So she stands me in front of a wall-sized Kandinsky painting and I'm staring at this thing and stupidly said out loud, this looks like a floating green hamburger. Fortunately, that didn't kill our relationship, and we got married about nine months later in September of 1966. I learned from her um, a kind of determination to persist and survive and succeed in spite of everything. My day would be pretty boring if I didn't have my hearing aids, so it's really important I carry spares and batteries and everything else. In fact, one of the advantages of a three-piece suit is that I can keep the batteries right here in my little vest pocket. Very handy, these little three-piece suits. I tend not to wear anything other than three-piece suits, with a few exceptions, and I know I shock everyone when I don't show up in a three-piece suit. I think it shows respect to show up well-dressed, but it also, uh, for me, reminds me I'm at work. So even when I work at home, I get dressed in my three-piece suit. Intellectual pursuits were very much a part of my life you know, growing up. I would place age 10, fifth grade as sort of a transformative period for me personally. Uh, I got a chemistry set. I got a book called The Boy Scientist with a bunch of experiments in it. Got very excited about word problems. It was very cool. It was like a little Agatha Christie uh, mystery and I have to figure out what's X. And the neat thing is you take this um, word description and transform it into a symbolic representation of what the word description meant, and then do a bunch of fairly standardized computations and extract X from the expression. I thought that was really cool. So that's the beginning of my interest in science and technology innovation. My father was Phi Beta Kappa. He was a very successful high school and college graduate. And I felt like I, a little bit like I was either competing with his record or at least had to meet it if I could, or beat it even. So I was encouraged to uh, excel academically. And I enjoyed all that stuff. I liked science and engineering and technology and literature. Uh, I read a lot, the house was full of books. Uh, my mother loved classical music. So I grew up listening to classical music on the radio, trying to guess the piece and the author or the composer before the announcer said what it was. A lot of my thinking and behavior is about connection with other people. This notion of co-invention, you know, two people in front of the whiteboard having a big debate is very much a connection kind of thing. So connecting with other people is very important to me. Steve Crocker has had an enormous impact on me because we became friends around 1959 when I, we were both in high school together. 
we found ourselves interested in in math particularly and and uh, generally technical stuff there was no math club which i thought was a, a serious defect so we went and started a math club Vin and i became pretty good friends uh, right away and we'd hang out together on the weekends and uh, and other times he got permission from uh, one of the uh, faculty members at ucla to use the computers there so we would go there in the evening or on the weekends to use a bendix g15 paper tape fed computer to do transcendental computations it was the spring 1960 and i was fooling around with a mathematical equation that you can't solve algebraically it doesn't have a, a, a natural solution like a quadratic equation and i thought well we could use computer to explore the equation we could sort of map it out sort of plug in values and then have uh, the answers come out. But we drove over and we get to the building and the building is locked. So Steve is preparing to just go home and, and I noticed that on the second floor the window was open or unlocked. Next thing I know he's on my shoulders and he's climbing in. He's a lot more limber than I am. He still is, but he was even then. Uh, so he climbs through the uh, window and he goes around and he opens up the industrial door, you know, push bar. We tape the door so we could get in and out. And we spend the day doing what we want to do on there. Nobody comes around, nobody bothers us. We cleaned up afterwards and, and that was the end of it. And that was the next big trigger point for me. It was discovering computers and programming, creating a little universe that does what you tell it to do. The wine cellar actually gets started as a consequence of my going to Germany uh, at the age of 19, uh, when I'm still an undergraduate at Stanford. And we had a wine cellar in the Stanford facility in Beutelsbach in Germany near Stuttgart. So I began sampling wines then, and when I got back, um, I started exploring wine tasting uh, while I was still an undergraduate. So that's been a part of my life for quite a long time. By the time we moved uh, here to the D.C. area, we had a 440-bottle wine cooler, and we ran out of room in the wine cooler. So we found a house that was big enough for us to build a wine cellar and could take all the antiques. The maturation of wine takes a long time. It's a very slow chemical process. Most of my projects take a long time. I mean, I've, um, the Internet continues as a project, really, for over 50 years. I have a lot of patience and persistence when it comes to projects. Uh, I, I, they don't have to happen overnight necessarily because sometimes things just take time. My undergraduate work at Stanford was a major in mathematics and a minor in German. Um, but while I was at Stanford, I got more exposure to computing and I took every computing class I could. And when I graduated, I went to work for IBM. So I'm, I'm vectored off into computing fairly early on by 1965. And then by the time I go back to college in 1967, after a couple of years at IBM, I get drawn into the ARPANET project. And now I'm completely infected with networking and it's, you know, this is a disease that you never get rid of. We wound up in graduate school together at UCLA at the exact moment that the ARPANET was being um, brought into existence. The Defense Department was exploring in the 1960s artificial intelligence, and it had a number of universities that were working on this. And uh, DARPA wanted to advance the state of the art as quickly as it could. And so rather than having to buy a brand new computer every year for each of the computer science departments who were saying, I need a new computer to do world-class research, they said, we're going to build a network. We're going to connect all your computers to each other. We're going to fund all of you. Please share your results with each other. Share your computing capability. Let's advance the state of AI as quickly as we can. So they decided to build a network, which they called the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, to connect these various brands of computers to each other. So we were involved with uh, how do you get these computers to talk to each other. A huge amount of work had gone into the design of the 
communication subnet, I'll call it. But there was no plan about what these computers were going to say to each other. Historically, the networks of the past had been uh, based on telephone services where you dial up something and somebody picks up the phone. And... But if you do that with computers, it takes forever. You know, you dial up, you have to wait till the other guy picks up the phone, you send some data, then you hang up, then you dial another computer. This other alternative was called packet switching. So DARPA builds this ARPANET thing, and Steve Crocker and I and many others work on this question of how do we get the computers to talk to each other through this packet switch net, and it works. It was so successful, we put a demo of that network up at the Washington Hilton in October of 1972. It's a great fanfare, it was a big success, and I got hired by DARPA to go, essentially ended up running the office that funded that. So by 1972, we know that packet switching is a thing that works and it, it has features that are really valuable. Email gets invented in the summer of 1971. DARPA is now seeing the success of the ARPANET and wants to use computers for command and control. But that has an implication that the computers are gonna to have to be in ships at sea and airplanes and mobile vehicles. And up till then, the ARPANET was designed to connect computers in fixed locations in air-conditioned rooms. At the suggestion of Steve Crocker, who said, there's this guy at UCLA you really ought to meet. Uh, I think you can get along well with him. And on one of my trips out to the West Coast, ended up, you know, getting to meet Bent and chatting with him. He and I worked together on the early testing of the ARPANET. And when I got into thinking about the internet and, and essentially expanding what we had done for one single net, the ARPANET, to a whole collection of networks that work together, it was very clear to me that protocols were gonna play a very important part. So he had already started working on a mobile radio network and a satellite network to do motion, you know, things in motion connected uh, in the same sense that the ARPANET connected computers to each other. So for six months, we tried to figure out how to do that. And by the fall of 1973, we figured out at least one way to do it. And uh, he concluded that we ought to write this up and, and submit it for publication in IEEE. And it was published by IEEE in May of 1974. It's called Protocol for Packet Network Intercommunication, if I recall the title correctly. But I remember the time we sat down to actually write the paper. Instead of being in my office where I would get distracted by his students and other things, uh, he suggested we should just uh, seclude ourselves at a hotel and, and write the paper. And I said, you want to start or should I? He said, no, I'll, I'll start. So gave him, I went out to pay for the conference room. I still have the receipt, the $16 we paid to rent that conference room that one day. I came back about 10 or 15 minutes later after paying for the room. I said, how are you doing? He hadn't written a single word, not one. It wasn't because his mind was a blank, he just didn't know how to get started. I don't know where to start because there's so many different things that you have to know in order to... So he says, well, let me start. So he writes, you know, five, six, seven pages, and I finally get it. I say, okay, I can do the rest, and I kept writing. So the two of us produced this manuscript, which I took to my secretary at Stanford, and I said, please type this up, which she did. Then she said, uh, what should I do with the uh, manuscript? And I said, well, you can throw that away because your type version is easier to read. The historians have never forgiven me for that. So, you know, this was launched a now 50 year career for me. People often ask, you know, when did you know this was gonna be a big thing? By 1977, I wanted very much to demonstrate that the technology we developed actually worked. We had three networks at the time, the packet radio network for mobile communication, ground mobile, and packet satellite communication for ships at sea, ship to ship, and ship to shore, and then the original ARPANET. And so I wanted a demonstration that all three of those networks would interwork with each other using the TCP IP protocols and so I uh, asked the teams that were working on this to demonstrate by having a mobile radio van in the San Francisco Bay Area going up and down radiating packets. 
that would go through the packet radio net into the ARPANET, go all the way across to Europe through an internal satellite hop down to London, hop out of the ARPANET into the packet satellite network, come back across the Atlantic through Middlesat Poor A, down to the east coast of the US and then back into the ARPANET and all the way to Los Angeles. Now the packet radio vans in San Francisco, Los Angeles is 400 miles to the south. The packets went 88,000 miles because they went through two synchronous satellite hops on their way to Europe and back. And it worked. And so that was, a, from my point of view as a program manager, it was a big deal because it basically I could pound my chest and say, you know what, this stuff actually works. And here's the demo. So that's 1977, November 22nd. The next big milestone is January 1983 when everybody had to switch over to running TCP IP on all the computers on all the networks we supported. And then I'm thinking, how is the general public and the private sector going to get access to it? Because in 1988, the only people who could reach it were people with research contracts with ARPA or Department of Energy or NASA or NSF uh, or military. So I asked permission from the Federal Networking Council, which was responsible for policy, to connect the MCI mail system, which is a commercial system, to the internet as an experiment. And they let me do it. So uh, by 89, we announced that we had a gateway between MCI mail and the internet. And as soon as we made that announcement, the other email service providers, which were closed systems, uh, like uh, telemail, for instance, or on time, said, well, wait a minute, you know, we want to have access to the internet too. And they got permission to connect. And as soon as they did that, they discovered that their little closed networks suddenly were interconnected with all the other closed networks and all their customers could talk to their competitors' customers through the internet. I was very happy about that. So we're almost off to the races. This is um, 1989. 1991, the World Wide Web hits. And this thing is still exploding. I think of all the things that uh, one could accomplish in an infrastructure project, we did the internet rollout about as well as I can imagine. Because here it is, 50 years later, still going strong, and globally speaking, writ large, I think we kind of nailed it. It has enabled a great deal to happen. Many people have benefited from the existence of this thing, whether it's finding information they're looking for or getting a training a video on YouTube or doing research or staying in touch with friends scattered all around the world. It really exceeded all expectations, I think, or at least uh, met the wildest expectations one could ever have. The thing that attracted me for sure and, and Vint and a substantial number of other people was the imagination of what great things could be done that uh, would seem like pure science fiction. So we are now at the point where we have a standardized interplanetary communication system design. It's being implemented. It'll be part of the Artemis mission returned to the moon and it almost certainly will have to be part of the Mars missions that come in the future. So, well, I mean, this is, this is not science fiction anymore, it's engineering. But it's exciting because that's what engineering is all about. It's translating science fiction into reality. I like being in a place where nobody has been before because almost anything you do is bound to be interesting. The most important lesson that I ever got was from a Nobel Prize winner, Josh Lederberg. I was um, explaining to Josh uh, what digital libraries could be. And I'd covered the whiteboard with a bunch of stuff. I got all done and Josh looked at me and he said, Vin, do something. That's the point. Do something. How many times have you heard people say, oh, I had that idea 20 years ago. The question is, did you do anything about it? That's what invention is all about. Do something.